Well, good evening again, and uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the 2021 public lecture of the Institute of International Monetary Research by Lord King. Uh, the Institute is an educational charity set up in 2014 and associated with the University of Buckingham. The purpose of the Institute is to demonstrate and bring to public attention the strong relationship between the quantity of money on the one hand and the levels of national income and expenditure on the other. Since March and April 2020, in our monthly notes, videos, and other publications, the, the Institute has been consistently uh, saying that the surge in money growth in 2020 in the USA, the Eurozone, and the UK, which has continued, though not to, though to, a, uh, to a lesser extent in 2021, would end up in an inflationary boom in the second half of 2021 and 2022. Of course, the link between excessive money growth and inflation is neither immediate nor automatic. Using Friedman's own words, it is subject to long and variable lags. But it holds over the medium to long term. This is one of the few fundamental universal laws in macroeconomics, one that has been studied by many economists for a long time. For example, uh, let me go back to my home country, by the Spanish scholastics in Salamanca, the so-called School of Salamanca, in the, in the 16th and 17th centuries, when they observed that uh, prices rose in Castile, uh, the greater the inflow of gold and silver coming from the America's wars. And yet, back in 2020, we were told by leading macroeconomic policy commentators, and indeed by central banks, central bankers indeed, that money didn't matter, didn't matter anymore. It was a sort of a barbarous relic, paraphrasing, uh, Jomana Keynes from the past, and that we shouldn't worry about inflation, but deflation in the coming years. Well, I'm sorry uh, that uh, they were wrong. They seem to be using a wrong theory of inflation, or perhaps they have uh, no comprehensive theory of inflation. As Charles Huhart uh, Masley put it recently, central bank seems to, flavor, uh, to favor sorry, uh, a bits and pieces approach to inflation. Of course, um, it is understandable to look at multiple indicators uh, to assess inflation, but it has to be done within a coherent and systematic and well-founded uh, theory. Now that they all tell us that inflation will be transitory, whatever that uh, means, uh, I'm afraid that uh, they still don't seem to be paying attention to the information provided by changes in the amount of money on inflation trends. Perhaps, uh, well, you may want to call me naive, but it is shocking to read a central bank report uh, or a press release explaining monetary policy decisions and find that the word money or, God forbid, uh, monetary aggregates are not mentioned at all. Uh, these are the topics the Institute uh, covers regularly. It is at the core of what we do. If you're interested in hearing more from us, uh, please subscribe to our monthly notes and our newsletter. You can find us very easily online. Just type the quantity equation, mv hyphen pt.org and you will find us. You will be able to register to our forthcoming uh, annual monetary conference precisely on inflation and whether it will last or it will be a transitory phenomenon on the 1st of December uh, held at the University of Buckingham. But enough from me, now I invite my colleague and chairman of the Institute, Professor Tim Condon, to introduce uh, Lorkin. Thank you and welcome to the lecture. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you can all hear me at the back. Um, it's a great pleasure um, this, uh, this evening to introduce uh, this event and particularly to introduce Lord King uh, to speak to us um, at this, the fifth annual lecture given, um, by, the, given by the Institute. Um, I've um, known um, Irving King uh, since the early 1970s. Um, we just discussed this a second ago, we couldn't work out exactly when, but um, uh, Mervyn and uh, John Kay uh, last year published a book on radical uncertainty, uh, and the title of uh, this morning's, this, this evening's lecture is Monetary Policy in a World of Radical Uncertainty. Now, 
John Kay, I, I certainly met over 50 years ago because he was my economic, economics tutor at St. John's Oxford, and he started in 1970. So we, we, we go back a long way. The title of this, as I say, is, is, is radical uncertainty, but we're going to hear a lot about inflation this evening. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a little secret, I've read this speech, I've read this lecture. And can I just say here that Mervyn King is very much entitled to talk about inflation. Uh, he became chief economist at the Bank of England um, in March 1991, when the rate of increase in the consumer price index in Britain was 8.3%. He became governor of the Bank of England in July 2003, when it was 1.3%. In December 2003, um, the then Labour government slightly tweaked the inflation target so that it was to be, in future, 2% a year in the increase in the consumer price index. Well, we haven't quite met it since then, not quite. The actual figure, the average rate of inflation on the consumer price index since then has been 2.1%. Compared with the kind of chaos on inflation that Britain had in the 1960s, 70s and 80s, this has been substantial progress in a key area of public policy. And I think if we should thank anyone, it's Mervyn King we should be thanking for this achievement. So we're very lucky to have him this evening talking to us uh, on this subject. On a personal note, um, I am very grateful to you, Mervyn, for doing this. Um, some of you in the room may know that I was very critical of some of the decisions taken um, by Mervyn and others uh, in the Great Recession 2007-2008. And I, wouldn't do, I was somewhat surprised when Mervyn accepted my invitation to give this lecture. Um, but if I put it this way, um, Mervyn is a big man. I mean, very big to override any personal resentment of that sort. And thank you. Um, this is not only a topical and relevant lecture, it's also a very witty and amusing one. Um, you may have heard of um, uh, uh, um, Mervyn King and Diego Maradona. Well, I don't think there's some, any conjectures in this lecture about whether Diego Maradona would have done a good job on the Monetary Policy Committee, but you never know. Uh, and. Um, the, um, you must also remember that um, Mervyn is a very strong supporter of Aston Villa Football Club. I'm sure there are lots of supporters of Aston Villa Football Club in the room. I'll let you down. There is absolutely no reference in this lecture Aston Villa Football Club. <laughs> Mervyn, thank you very much for doing, giving this lecture this evening. Um, thank you all very much for coming. We're in for an intellectual treat. Thank you again. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tim, and good evening, everyone. Fifty years ago, I was a graduate student in my first semester at Harvard. I knew that winter in Cambridge, Massachusetts was cold, and I had therefore already purchased a winter coat in a country that understands winter clothing, Finland, where I visited friends who helped me choose the perfect coat Unfortunately, the shop would not accept my payment. The previous day, President Nixon had broken the link between the dollar and gold, and international payments were temporarily suspended. Using a sort of do-it-yourself version of Hawala, the coat was in the end purchased. And that winter, I stayed warm, but the dollar did not. In fact, it fell sharply in the months after that. When I bought my coat, inflation in Britain had just hit 10%, up from only 1.4% only four years earlier. On both sides of the Atlantic, 
inflation continued to rise, reaching 27% here in Britain in the summer of 1975. Eventually, policymakers realized that the solution to the inflation problem was monetary policy. But it took another decade or so before a combination of theory and practice led to a credible policy framework that sustained low and stable inflation. Once again, inflation has risen well beyond the expectations of central banks. In the United States, CPI inflation is now 6.2%, and as the chairman of the Federal Reserve said earlier this month, the level of inflation we have right now is not at all consistent with price stability. Chart 1 here shows the Federal Reserve's preferred measure of inflation. This is the core personal consumption expenditure deflator, PCE inflation. And I find two things interesting about this chart. First, that inflation over the past decade was always in the range 1 to 2 percent. It never threatened to fall below zero, but it's now risen to its highest level in 30 years. Oops. Chart 2 shows UK CPI inflation. Now, as you know, 4.2%, it's well above target. Now, much of the ups and downs of UK inflation over the past decade reflect movements in the sterling exchange rate. That is not true of the recent rise in inflation, with the effective exchange rate rather stable and, in fact, a little higher than a decade ago. In its latest monetary policy report, the Bank of England forecast that inflation will exceed 5% in the spring of next year, but argued that higher inflation was, and I quote, still most likely to prove transitory. Both in the US and UK, official interest rates were left unchanged and remain close to zero. Even in the euro area, inflation has exceeded 4% the highest rate since the financial crisis, and interest rates remain negative. Around the world, from China to Latin America, inflation is rising. Now, while much of the rise in inflation may turn out to be transitory, a word that will surely enter the lexicon of central banking, there is clearly great uncertainty about whether inflation, when it falls back, will fall back to below the target or remain above it. My concerns about the inflation outlook stem in part from recent data, but even more so from the intellectual foundation of central bank policy. Central banks have been caught out by this sudden upturn in inflation. For several years, they have been giving forward guidance that interest rates will remain close to or below zero for the indefinite future. They have drawn heavily on concepts derived from a family of theoretical models which rely on the assumption that expectations drive inflation and central banks drive expectations. Inflation in the long run is determined by the official inflation target. In the early days of the Monetary Policy Committee, we pored over various forecasts for inflation produced by the bank staff for different interest rate decisions. No matter which path of interest rates we simulated, inflation always returned to target. Why? Because in these models, the only determinant of inflation in the medium term was the official target. This is the King Canute theory of inflation. <laughs> a thousand years ago, King Canute set his throne by the seashore and commanded the incoming tide to halt. The tide continued to rise, driven by the laws of nature. A satisfactory theory of inflation cannot take the form, inflation will remain low because we say it will. It has to explain how changes in money, whether directly via QE 
or indirectly via changes in interest rates, affect the economy. The old idea that inflation reflects too much money chasing too few goods has more relevance than the view that it is driven solely by expectations. But I've now mentioned the word that dare not speak its name, money. Money has disappeared from modern models of inflation. You don't have to believe that there is a stable and unchanging mechanical link between a particular measure of money and inflation to regret that development. Expectations do matter, but they are an incomplete description of the way changes in interest rates and the money supply translate into prices. And when people start to distrust the word of the central bank, they look at monetary variables, especially the broad money supply, to gauge the outlook for inflation. So the question I want to pose tonight is, has monetary policy lost its intellectual anchor? In so doing, I want to make clear that I'm not criticizing decisions of the Bank of England made in recent months and years. The Monetary Policy Committee has access to more data and information than do I. But I am concerned about the intellectual framework that has come to dominate central bank thinking in all the advanced economies. I want to start by sketching two implications of radical uncertainty, that is uncertainty that cannot be quantified, that should underpin any credible monetary policy framework. I then want to describe three illusions in the theory and practice of monetary policy that have, I think, led us astray. And finally, I want to suggest that we abandon four ideas that emanate from current academic thinking and suggest a more robust and resilient approach to monetary policy. One of the progenitors of the application of probabilistic reasoning to economics, Frank Ramsey, understood its limitations when he wrote in 1929, and I quote, the chief danger to our philosophy, apart from laziness and wooliness, is scholasticism, the essence of which is treating what is vague as if it were precise and trying to fit it into an exact logical category. And this danger has two implications for how to think about monetary policy in a world of radical uncertainty. First, the difference between a barter economy and a monetary economy is simply assumed away. In 1954, the Chicago statistician, Jimmy Savage, imagined a world where people could attach probabilities to every conceivable event. And as a result, they could engage in optimizing behavior. Savage made clear that this was a purely intellectual exercise because his assumptions held only in what he described as small worlds and were, in his own words, utterly ridiculous. The large world could not be described in this way, as John Kay and I discuss in our book, Radical Uncertainty. Indeed, Savage's small world corresponds exactly to the economist's world of complete markets in which neither money nor monetary policy have any role at all. It's striking, therefore, that the richness of the analysis of a monetary economy developed over the years by Keynes, Patinkin, Tobin, Brunner and Meltzer, among others, has been replaced by models which in effect assume complete markets. I suppose it's a tribute to the technical virtuosity of their creators that models in which money is completely absent can be used to explain a fall in the value of money. The second implication of radical uncertainty is that the structure of the economy is assumed, well, the danger of ignoring this, of the scholasticism, is, is that the 
structure of the economy is assumed to be unchanging over long time periods. In the jargon, it is stationary. Now, this assumption is crucial to the use of econometric models to identify stable time series relationships. In 1939, Maynard Keynes foresaw the problem in his review of Tinbergen's statistical estimates of economic relationships. And 75 years later, two of Britain's most distinguished econometricians, David Hendry and Graham Meisen, pointed out that the conventional models used by central banks fail to predict or even explain the global financial crisis precisely because the world is non-stationary. The forecasting models used by central banks perform quite well when nothing much is happening and fail dramatically when something big occurs, precisely the moment when we might hope that the models would have something to offer beyond mere extrapolation of the past. Radical uncertainty and non-stationarity go hand in hand. A good example comes from the British battle against inflation 40 years ago. In the first half of the 1980s, reliance was placed on targets for the monetary aggregates. In the second half, policy focused on implicit and then explicit targets for the exchange rate against the Deutschmark. Both came somewhat unstuck because of non-stationarity. Significant changes in financial regulation in the early 1980s altered the relationship between inflation and the monetary aggregates, and German reunification altered the appropriateness of linking sterling to the Deutschmark. With the benefit of hindsight, the degree of tightness of UK monetary policy was probably better indicated by the exchange rate in the early 1980s and the monetary aggregates towards the end of the decade. Intermediate targets of this kind fell victim to non-stationarity and monetary policy was then expressed in terms of the final target of low and stable inflation. But that did not mean that money was irrelevant to the setting of policy. In their rush to jettison money from the analysis of inflation, many economists have relied on the apparent instability in estimated demand for money functions. But as I argued in my book, The End of Alchemy, the fact that money demand can shift unpredictably, as in the jump in demand for liquidity in 2007-8, and again for a short period in March last year, that tells us nothing about the implications of increases in the money supply at other times. And it seems odd at a time when broad money has been rising at the highest rates for many years, not even to ask what that is telling us. As Tim Congan and Charles Goodhart have repeatedly reminded us, you ignore big rises in broad money at your peril. I turn now to the three illusions that have characterized the theory and in turn the practice of monetary policy in recent years. Those three illusions are, first, the belief that models are a description of the world and generate reliable forecasts. Second, the misdiagnosis of developments in the economy that result from reliance on a single narrow model. And third, the use of forward guidance. So let me start with the misuse of models. Models are neither right nor wrong. They're either more or less useful. They're not descriptions of the world. They're deliberately constructed to be sim simplifications of it. And that's why economic forecasts are often so poor. They can give extremely valuable insights, but they're not a substitute for trying to figure out what is happening in the large world. John Kay and I recommend always asking the question, what is going on here? At first sight, this may seem trivial, but it is in fact immensely helpful in interpreting economic data. A good example of the power of asking what is going on here was the early realization by the Bank of England of the large numbers of migrant workers arriving in the UK from the accession countries of Eastern Europe after 2004. 
despite official statistics showing the opposite. Monthly visits to different parts of the United Kingdom by members of the Monetary Policy Committee and the regular reports from the Bank of England's regional agents made it impossible to ignore the phenomenon and incidentally helped to change the way official migration statistics were collected. Our contacts in the regions changed the narrative that we used. Labour supply was no longer fixed. The output gap, the difference between aggregate demand and potential supply, became less and less relevant to monetary policy because demand was generating its own supply of labour. The Phillips curve appeared to be flatter and flatter. In the limit, the output gap became meaningless. After Brexit, the narrative has changed again. The elastic supply of labour has largely disappeared and the output gap is once more relevant to assessing the appropriate monetary policy stance. The lesson is not to shoehorn the analysis of the economy into a single model. The second illusion, the misdiagnosis of developments of the economy as in the response to COVID-19. The case for substantial monetary expansion in March 2020 was framed as a response to dysfunctional markets. But the monetary injection was not withdrawn once financial markets were operating normally. The stimulus was then justified in terms of supporting the economy. And the government did indeed need to support the economy. It did so through furlough schemes in Europe and more generous unemployment compensation in the United States. And the success of those schemes can be seen in chart three. Unemployment in the US rose extremely sharply in 2020, but has now fallen back to pre-COVID levels, while unemployment in the UK rose hardly at all through the pandemic, something which many even of the official forecasters didn't anticipate. The furlough scheme was a transfer from future taxpayers to businesses to allow them to maintain employment during a period when revenue fell sharply. It wasn't designed to boost aggregate demand. What about monetary policy? Well, monetary stimulus is often seen as appropriate when aggregate demand falls below aggregate supply. In a typical business cycle, demand falls in a recession while potential supply is largely unchanged. An output gap opens up and monetary policy can help to close that gap. So far, so good. But COVID-19 was not an ordinary business cycle downturn. Chart four shows aggregate demand or GDP in the UK over the past two years on the one hand, and potential supply as estimated by the Office for Budget Responsibility earlier this month on the other. Now, as you can see or not see, it isn't easy to distinguish the two lines on the chart. As the OBR stated in their March report, the chart, and I quote, shows only a small margin of spare capacity since the start of the pandemic, reflecting our judgment that most of the fall in output during 2020 should be thought of as a simultaneous contraction in demand and supply. Given that, given that demand and supply have moved in tandem and in parallel, it's far from clear that an additional monetary stimulus was required either last year or this. Quantitative easing is an expansion of the money supply, although most central banks are reluctant to describe it as such, which has made calibration of changes to QE difficult and at times seemingly arbitrary. Unlike its use after the banking crisis a decade or so ago, which was aimed at preventing a fall in broad money, this time QE has created a substantial monetary overhang. In the United States, M3 was rising at an annual rate of 24% late last year. It's now fallen back to a mere 
in the latest figure. And in the UK, M3 was rising in the spring of this year at 13% a year and has now subsided to around an annual rate of 7%. Now, it's certainly possible to debate the transmission mechanism between an increase in broad money and its impact on inflation. But the fact remains that we experienced a substantial, substantial, albeit transitory, increase in the growth rate of broad money, and we are now experiencing a noticeable, albeit perhaps transitory, rise in inflation. As the recent report of the Economic Affairs Committee of the House of Lords argued, quantitative easing has become the first resort of central banks to bad news of almost any kind. And the failure to withdraw QE in response to good news, or even the absence of bad news, has led to a ratchet effect on central bank balance sheets. This is unsustainable, and the difficulty of reducing the size of those balance sheets at a time of large budget deficits is self-evident. The third illusion I want to highlight is the use of forward guidance as a tool of monetary policy. Precisely because the future is radically uncertain, it is unwise for a central bank to speculate on its own future decisions. The Federal Reserve does not know the short-term policy rate it will want to set six months from now, let alone what it will want to do in 2023 and 2024. The danger now is that although financial markets may have lost considerable faith in the forward guidance given to them, central banks themselves continue to believe in it and to cling to a narrative about the future path of interest rates that is no longer credible, with inevitable problems for the clear communication of policy decisions. Markets compute their estimate of the future path of interest rates by feeding their own view of the evolution of the economy into the central bank reaction function. Their narrative of where the economy is headed may well be different from that of the central bank. Indeed, challenge to those narratives is healthy. And forward guidance, which conflates the reaction function with the narrative of the central bank, is dangerous precisely because it dampens the impact of debates about the economy and switches market focus to quasi-commitments by central banks to a future path of interest rates. There is nothing to be gained by doing this and much credibility to be lost. Equally unwise are the first cousins of forward guidance. Yield curve control adopted by Japan and Australia. Flexible average inflation targeting announced last year by the Federal Reserve and promises to aim at a higher inflation rate in order to lower today's real interest rate. The Federal Reserve now appears to have introduced so-called flexible average inflation targeting at the worst possible time. No one argued that inflation over 6% was desirable to offset earlier undershoots of the target. It was always an illusion to think that it was possible to control inflation so precisely in order to overshoot the target by a small amount for a short period to compensate for earlier undershoots. Earlier this month, the Reserve Bank of Australia was forced by market movements to abandon yield curve control aimed at holding the three-year bond yield at 0.1%. And their governor said that it's quite unlikely that we will have a yield target again. And the attempts by the Bank of Japan to target 10-year bond yields and stimulate the economy by aiming at a higher inflation rate are reminiscent of an Olympic high jumper who, having failed to clear two meters, asks for the bar to be raised in an attempt to convince onlookers he is confident that he can clear an even higher bar. Forward guidance can all too soon come to be seen as complacency. A central bank should not be ashamed to acknowledge that it does not know where interest rates will be in the future 
because it cannot know where the economy will go in the months and years ahead. Whatever different economic models were being used on the 1st of January <clears throat> last year to forecast the economy over the next few years, none of those models included a shutdown of large parts of the economy in response to COVID-19. What a central bank does know is its own reaction function to aim to bring inflation back to target over a time horizon which reflects the nature of the shocks hitting the economy. Its role is to focus on the setting of the policy instrument, whether interest rates or QE, today, not in three years' time. In a report on the monetary policy of the Swedish Riksbank, the late Marvin Goodfriend and I showed how damaging it was for their policy committee to be distracted from the immediate policy decision into an internal debate about where interest rates should be in three years' time. The communications of a central bank need to focus on explaining its reaction function and a narrative about the state of the economy that changes over time, meeting by meeting, report by report. The only forward guidance markets and economic agents need is an unswerving commitment to price stability. So let me turn to the need for four funerals and a wedding in monetary policy. The four funerals mean that we should say farewell to forward guidance, to flexible average inflation targeting, <clears throat> to the pretense that money has nothing to do with inflation, and the belief that monetary stimulus is an appropriate response to all economic problems. On a more positive note, the wedding is to join the analysis of what's going on in the economy with the eternal verities of David Hume and most subsequent economists that inflation is a monetary phenomenon. The aim should be to reinforce the belief among economic agents that central banks are committed to learning about the economy and adapting policy in order to maintain price stability. A credible reaction function can then reduce the number of arbitrary and unexpected changes in policy. As I explained in the end of Alchemy, talking about the Maradona theory of monetary policy. I won't go into that now. But in a world of radical uncertainty, we have to go further than that. The economy is always changing, and no fixed plan will survive contact with the world. So the next step is to adopt what we might call the Pep Guardiola theory of monetary policy, which is to equip the players to make good decisions for themselves on the pitch in real time. You don't give a fixed plan to the players because it will be negated both by an intelligent opposition and unexpected changes in circumstances. As Helmut von Moltke wrote in 1880, no plan survives first contact with the enemy, a sentiment with which I am sure the Federal Reserve would now sympathize. Forward guidance fails the test of the Guardiola theory of monetary policy. So what are the principles for helping central bankers make good decisions in real time? The principle behind inflation targeting was to give a degree of discretion, constrained discretion, to members of the Monetary Policy Committee. They were to set interest rates to meet the inflation target delegated by Parliament, while forcing them to produce a narrative explaining the justification for those decisions that was updated regularly by the MPC and continuously challenged by others. Inflation tar targeting was not meant as a non-monetary theory of inflation. Rather, it was seen as a way to take decisions in a world of radical uncertainty. And I think a similar approach was followed by central banks that didn't adopt formal inflation targets, such as the European Central Bank. <clears throat> 
Good economic policy frameworks are resilient and robust with respect to unexpected developments in the economy. In a world of radical uncertainty, the Holy Trinity comprises, first, a narrative about the changing structure of the economy that is explained clearly and transparently. Second, a process by which the prevailing narrative can be challenged. And third, a heuristic for setting policy that is robust with respect to the many surprises in the economic climate. Above all, keep it simple. An inflation target was a simpler and more robust heuristic than an intermediate target. When King Canute sat in front of the incoming tide, his purpose was not to show his courtiers that he was, his purpose was to show his courtiers that he was not omnipotent, omnipotent and could not by words alone undo the forces of nature. Central banks would do well to show the same humility. Price stability suggested the former vice chairman of the Fed, Alan Blinder, was when most people stop talking about inflation. After 20 years of low and stable inflation, people have started talking about inflation again. Two years ago, the Bank of England renamed its inflation report as the Monetary Policy Report, with a coloured photograph of Glasgow on the cover. Inflation was 1.7% and predicted to decline. Today, inflation is 4.2% and predicted to rise. The role of a central bank is to be the voice for price stability and to preserve their hard-earned and vital independence. Central banks should accept, indeed insist, that their mandate is a narrow one. Inflation will remain a major challenge in the years ahead as we embark on a significant reallocation of resources in our economies resulting from the greater focus on resilience as we emerge from the pandemic, the political pressures to raise public spending, and the restructuring required to meet climate change targets. This reallocation of resources will imply big changes in relative prices and wages. Whether this can easily be achieved while keeping overall inflation close to 2% remains to be seen. The consequences of a shift in resources within the economy from low to more profitable sectors are not something that appear in the current models of monetary policy. And the belief that such models actually describe the world has done damage to the credibility of central banks, as illustrated by the communications problems of several central banks over the past year or so. Short of an intellectual about turn, it will continue to do so. After a decade of sluggish economic growth, despite the largest monetary stimulus the world has ever seen, it is surely time to recognise that many, if not most, economic problems are not amenable to monetary policy solutions. The next decade will see a major restructuring of economies around the world. We shall need to ask with increasing frequency what is going on here? Central banks will continue to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. They will hope for good fortune, but should not rely on it. They will have to cope with the challenge of setting monetary policy, not in a small model, but in the large world of radical uncertainty. The current scale of monetary expansion cannot persist for long without inflationary consequences. Now is the time for central banks to take a gentle step back from being in thrall to the latest theoretical advance and to avoid becoming the slaves of living economists. When President Clinton nominated Alan Greenspan for his fourth term in office in 2000, he hailed, and I quote, a rare combination of technical expertise, sophisticated analysis, and old-fashioned common sense. Common sense suggests 
that when too much money is chasing too few goods, the result is inflation. An over-reliance on expectations and central bank words has proved a dragging anchor for monetary policy in the industrialized world. It is time both to change policy and to secure a more reliable intellectual anchor. Thank you. much and uh, may I say thank you on behalf of the Institute. It's been a very interesting presentation, really excellent. Uh, and thank you for the time in addressing the question from the audience. Sure, pleasure. And thank you all for, for coming. We'll have a, a drinks reception right after the, the end of the lecture. Thank you. Thank you.